So uh, thanks everyone for coming. So for this uh, seminar presentation, my final seminar presentation, I'm actually not presenting on my research, but I'm presenting on some outreach work, which I completed over the years and specifically some work I did in 2022. Uh, this is the application of geophysics to look for unmarked burials, specifically unmarked burials uh, associated with uh, residential school content. So I'll give a bit of a trigger warning that in this presentation, uh, unlike a lot of mineralogical ones, there will be some discussion of, of death and burials. There's no gruesome images, but there's data that does reflect uh, burials. So the, the residential school that we are um, serving in this capacity is located in southwestern Manitoba. It's called the Brandon Indian Residential School. It was in operation from the late 19th century to 1972. Um, it's suspected there's 104 possible burials, and they, they are not in one site, but they are located across four, at least four suspected sites within the, the grounds of the, the school. And what I'm presenting on here today is work um, focusing on one of those sites, which is, um, has been uh, classified as a cemetery in the past, and which was in operation from 1928 to 1958. But the main objectives of locating any unmarked burials, which have been masked over time, um, as well as to document the performance of ground penetrating radar for use within a specific uh, context. So we're, we'll definitely be talking about ground penetrating radar. Um, it's, um, it's an electromagnetic method and, and also we're using some supporting information um, from electromagnetic surveys. So it's a little confusing to introduce to both as electromagnetic, but they are. The difference between the two, um, in essence, is that GPR uses high frequency signals. And these signals will, will propagate through the earth and then scatter off objects and then reflect back to the unit they measure, getting a sense of depth of things that it's echoing off of. Whereas electromagnetic surveys are a much lower frequency and they induce a secondary field in conductive objects in the earth which then re-radiate and are then detected by the instrument. The, um, in general, um, the depth that a GPR unit can see is dependent upon the frequency of the signal which it's transmitting. So the lower the frequency, the, the deeper it can sense um, at a cost of resolution. Whereas electromagnetic methods in themselves are, are largely independent of frequency, but more dependent on the separation of the coils for control of um, how, how deep it is sensing. Now, applying GPR for this sort of work, there's, there's two broad approaches. Um, and uh, the straightforward one is to, to scatter energy directly up the burials and try to detect them. Uh, this, this could be confounded by the fact that the energy that you're trying to, to collect may be interrupted by other things in the ground. So for instance, I'm showing here on, this, on the right, um, on this side here, uh, I got in there, a cartoon of you know, a GPR operator and he's traveling in a profile uh, looking for that object, sending the waves down. And when he gets over it, the, the reflected wave will be measured. But you can imagine that if there was an object you were interested deeper than that object, there would be no energy reaching that object because it's been scattered off the upper one. That's, that's one main limitation. Um, so because this is, we are looking in this specific site, which is suspected cemetery in itself, we can also try to use this technology to look for broad-based terrain-like features. And that's to reconstruct the earthworks, look for you know, retaining walls, boundary ditches, or anything that can kind of indicate the, the past uh, you know, spatial extents of the place, just to, to really give a higher probability in a, with an aerial extent of the burials within that spot. In general, yes, I mentioned like the limitations of GPRs that could be scattered. Uh, this could be caused by, by things in the ground itself, stones, burrows, uh, debris. Um, it also could be the decoupling of the antenna itself. So it's often assumed in cartoons like this that you know, GPR is on a flat piece of ground, but in reality, there's a lot of bumps. So the, you know, if it's bumping, it's gonna get an airspace in between and that will also reflect a lot of energy. Uh, it's also, there is a dependency on the material properties of that sensing itself. Overly conductive soil will, will attenuate the signal, particularly if that conductivity is driven by water content in the soil. And here's just a couple examples from the site of things that exist at the top of the soil, which will, will scatter energy and create noise. You know, stones, uh, burrows, roots, and there's probably some bits of fence and, and debris also that are in the area. 
as far as like the, the, the physical properties of the media itself, that's a lot harder to tell from the surface. So, and, and I could demonstrate that in this aerial photo. So in this photo here, uh, the, the cemetery site, as you're studying, has been kind of closed in with a fence area here. That's the main area and it has a circular or like a, a cement uh, concrete cairn in the middle. But you can kind of tell on the, on the picture here, there's no real difference, you know, between anything in here and then moving out here. In general, the, the area is sort of hemmed in by kind of like a terrain dip. That's sort of perhaps an old river channel that kind of keeps it in a peninsula. And, uh, and there, there is some staining in the vegetation and the soil in the area around there, but nothing that could show you that there's a change in one type of, you know, boundary to another in this. Uh, to, to see underground physically there, we don't have a permit to excavate, uh, but there are road cuts in the area. So on the road leading up to the site, you can get a sense of what the, the sedimentation is in the area. So it's great and uh, correlate that with some water well logging that's been in the area. Uh, so here's the upper couple meters and it's showing just a lot of sand. It's, uh, you know, well sorted with some few class in it, but well drained uh, uh, sand in the area. Uh, further down the hill, uh, there's some deeper profiles. They again, they have that sort of sand uh, cross bedded sort of sedimentation on the top, but underlain by diamictite and, and other kind of glacial fluvial uh, deposits. And the big difference between the two is that you know diamictite itself could be really poorly sorted. It could contain a lot of clay in its matrix, and as far as the physical properties go, they will tend to be less resistive than than, uh, than poor sand. Some of the, the land use itself from the, from the area could be kind of reconstructed from maps of the area. So I, I found one map from 1964, a land use map. And uh, on this one here, I kind of just put uh, a red line around the current cemetery fence and some of the other fencing area, just to give some idea of where things are right now. And one of the things is, of course, there's no cemetery on this map, although we know it existed. Um, the tree line is generally the same in the area. So we know that that hasn't changed much. But the most interesting thing is these gravel deposits, which have been mentioned. In an aerial photo, I showed that you could not see any sort of deposit like this. There wasn't evident in the map itself. Some aerial photos, historical aerial photos, um, are on file. They go back to about the 40s. They, they tend to get blurrier as you go back in time. But I found that uh, a few from the 50s and 60s are of use, particularly uh, this set here, showing the difference between 1964 and 1969. Again, I kind of outlined the, the outline of the cemetery, and um, and then showing that when you get to 1969, all of a sudden there's this white material that appears right here, and that's co-located with that map where it shows that there was a gravel pit there. But another interesting thing to point out is that this the color of this material seems to be linked to the color of that material, suggesting that that material was brought over, and at the time that um, seems to have given the outline of this fenced area. It was built up based on that. And some, some direct probing also helps confirm this. This was done in a master's thesis until 15 by a colleague of mine. It wasn't done in a systematic way, but there were some done inside the very inside the cemetery fence and some outside. And um, most importantly, the stuff inside the fence did show that there was a, a grainier matrix at the top. And whatever did pass through the probe itself had a coarser texture, remarkably different than what was outside. So in terms of uh, applying geophysics to now try to delineate that fenced area, well, we begin with yet another aerial photo. This one's from the 50s. This one here does show uh, vegetation staining in an area that is presumed to be the cemetery itself. And when I plotted the outline of the fence as it exists today, it's uh, pretty obvious that that area extends north of the, of the fenced area. So that, that area itself doesn't appear to completely cover the historical cemetery. And so that's what I've sort of drawn in the, with the green outline here. There's also kind of like a, a set of small circular pit-like features that are evident. These are possible burials, or there could be some kind of uh, boundary. It's unsure from this picture, but I've marked them in. And we designed our surveys so that they would cover these, these unknowns so that we can try to uncover what's been going on. So some of the information I use is from a 2012 GPR survey and just showing the, the footprint of that area here, where it covered. This used a, a 500 megahertz antenna, 
which is pretty standard for archaeological applications. They also performed one EM survey within the boundaries of the fence itself. For the, for the new st um, data collection, we focused on going north and trying to do it in a continuous fashion. And we did this over the course of three days. So I can get my pen back. There's three grids, one for each day. These two, the orange and the pink one, are done in, um, with a higher amount of profiles. There are some going north-south, some going east-west to so the crisscross, just to really constrain the area. And then we did, on the third day, a one that was twice as large, but just with the north-south profiles, just to, uh, with a lower trace density, just to push the, the margin out as far as we can with the time that we had. Uh, we followed that up in September with an EM survey, and this was done in multiple grids, uh, just to cover the, the whole available extent of that, that green footprint, which I've drawn. This takes a picture of the GPR unit with a 250 megahertz antenna, and then the, the electromagnetic profile. And in terms of the data, I won't dwell on this too much, but I took the GPR data, I cleaned it up and plotted it in 3D, but I also created an amplitude volumes. So that's where you take those traces and you interpolate between them and you make a volume of a certain type of attribute that represents how much energy is in the area, and you can slice them to different depths. And similarly with EM, I produced a map which is, um, represents the surface. But this is a, an amplitude map from the 2012 survey. And um, that, again, that covers that footprint of the whole area. But one of the striking features that is evident on this map is that within the fenced area itself, uh, you can, it's pretty clear to notice that the, the signal drops off all of a sudden, um, as though it's respecting the, the margins of the fence. Whereas on the outside, other features start to become evident, these, these lobes, as I call them, and, and dark um, channel-like features. They're not present inside the fence itself. But when we lowered the frequency of the GPR and repeated through some of that area, that, that difference did go away. So it appears as though that the higher frequency GPR was scattering off of some sort of surface um, material, whereas the lower frequency one was able to penetrate that more clearly. And this is sort of evident in the traces themselves. So this is one profile. This one on the end is that sort of lower trace density kind of reconnaissance survey, but the, the, the higher density grids are here. And at this boundary here where this arrow is, you can see that this is where the, the fence of the cemetery itself is, and in the, in the information in the traces themselves, you get a very high amount of reflectivity in the subsurface, which then suddenly disappears when you step outside. So the characteristics of the, of the material properties suddenly change at this margin, even though when we're on the ground, you can't see the difference physically. And then just looking from the other direction, looking north, um, one thing that's evidence in the trace data is that there's geological features. Uh, I showed in that one early image that kind of channel that was cut and there's cross bedding. I believe this is probably cross bedding of the same degree. And it's dipping to the northeast. However, at the very eastern extent, that sort of ends. It, um, that kind of patterning of dipping um, becomes a more chaotic texture. And that's again here shown on this image. So this is a 3D view of that data now. Here's the fence there and I'm overlaying that the amplitude map and shown uh, one slice of the GPR data was a filtering to enhance it. There's that kind of dipping cross bedding right there. Um, there is one burial evident if in the cemetery here from that profile. And this is what that signature looks like. It has what's called the shadow zone. And then there's this sort of like trough like feature on the eastern extent. And this sort of feature here that I'm showing here with um, this association with the dip in amplitude is found again outside the fence, one here and then one here, suggesting that that cemetery did exist further north from the detection of burials themselves. Uh, there's a, another feature which became evident, and you may have seen this in the, in the amplitude map, uh, showing that there is sort of a linear cut going through there. It's almost as this lobe has been cut by something. And when you look at the trace data, at about one meter deep, there is a, a bottom reflection going across that. Um, and that could represent some sort of path or boundary or ditch that was filled over over time. And for the EM results, they uh, they do sort of support the the, um, the the idea that the cemetery extends this way. But there is an interesting feature uh, on this corner here. So you can see that the, 
I've, I've mapped the resistivities, and the resistivities in the southeast quadrant of the cemetery itself are much higher than they are in the northeast and the north and everywhere else. But they do kind of gradually taper off. So that when they're higher, they're not sharply demarcated. And um, this represents that there is a change in materials, but a very gradual and maybe tapering in thickness going from this off to the north. And uh, so when I start to integrate all this data together, I could, I could tell that now that um, there was some probably some sort of coarse gravel area, maybe diatomic type. Um, it occurred in the 60s as, as um, evidenced by the aerial photos, and that there is some sort of boundary ditch too that's been cut in. And it's, it's the bottom of which is one meter beneath the present day surface. Um, as far as the instrumentation goes, we found that the 500 megahertz or quote unquote the higher frequency GPR had some signal to noise ratio loss um, or, um, within the cemetery, whereas when we lowered the frequency, it became less effective. We were able to resolve some of the broader features that help put the context of the site together. Um, and now I, I just put back in that green outline of the suspected area. And what's most interesting on here is when you put those, those little circular pits, they do tend to line up directly with that linear feature. So. We probably could rule them out as burials themselves, but we're probably some kind of deep areas within a ditch or a path or trackway that was cut into the, uh, the hillside at, at that time. And uh, just showing the trace data for one last image, um, my, my general impression of the area is was that it existed. Um, untouched, it would have been a geological a heel with uh, <coughs> cross bedding in it, and this has been cut at some point, and you can see in the sharp change in reflectivity that occurs right along the margin here, along this change in, in scattering intensity, and that is also carried over here, but on this end it's marked by a kind of a, a dipping, a uh, shallowly dipping surface, which may, may represent a, a prior surface of the area. So in general, um, the um, it was sort of an integrated approach would sort of reveal what was going on. Uh, we had to we had to adjust the, the parameters of the GPR survey to have a successful result in this area. Um, and these findings do have implications for the ongoing search in that any burials that maybe there may be deeper than we've expected because of the training modification that's gone on. And uh, that's the end. <laughs> Thanks for your time. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Any questions? How about questions from people online? Let me see if there's. Chris, I have a of questions. So oh. when you show the, the section of the ground penetrating radar, it gets that stripes. So those are stripes showing different physical properties? Yes. Um, small contrasts in them. And uh, I, I'll show you again. Uh, the, um, the wavelength of the GPR itself, and the one we use 250 megahertz, or sorry, yeah, 250 megahertz, is going to be pretty broad. So a lot of these stripes in here may be just, uh, just the signal itself. It might not be discrete features, because they can't resolve as fine of a detail. Um, that being said, I have looked at the, the higher frequency GPR, so it's going to have a shorter wavelength and be able to resolve more finely. And what I did see, I basically saw this again, but it was uh, it was divided into separate layers. They look to be half a meter apart. So I'm, I've seen it in a, in a mining scenario where people are using ground penetrating radar to try to find stokes. Mindset. How deep is it practical for GPR to go? It's uh, so with, the, with hard rock. With hard rock, that's interesting. I I I know that the it's highly experimental for mineral exploration use. Like there's some people that indicate that it could be used, and others are naysayers. But in general, if you had a very low frequency, I mean, relative to what we're using, um, you could detect a, you know, more conductive features. Like if you had an ore zone that was in a slope and it was significantly more conductive than the, the game around it, and it was significantly large. Um, 
Yeah, the, you know, the application was like a it was at Cripple Creek, and they were using GPR just to, because it didn't where all the scopes were, right? We didn't want to drop the truck down into a big Oh, space. looking for like a mined out scope, oh, of course, yeah, so an airspace. Yeah, then it would be probably more sensitive, because that, that air is going to be like a, a highly different like permittivity than the rock around it, so it should reflect. And, and that's, uh, they do a lot of that in like um, civil engineering practices, where they're looking for old tunnels, um, I'm sure it could definitely could be applied. As far as depth, it depends on, on your frequency. And so if you were looking like a kilometer below, no, probably not. But if it was, you know, within the upper 100 meters and the scope itself was sufficiently large, um, then the, it's possible, yeah. Pinko did some cross borehole radar at a mine here in Sudbury, and they found that they could, they could resolve things when the boreholes are about 40 meters apart. I think that I think in South Africa they did some work in coal mines, and the coal seams are highly resistive, and they were very useful for identifying more conductive barriers associated with paleo channels and things like that. So there's been some work. I have a question about your interpretation that you talked about. You talked about some infill. If you could go to one of the latest slides. Sure. I think I have a good one here, sure. Yeah, that's the one. So, I mean. There's a good argument you have here that they have some sort of material in the top, um, particularly in, inside the fence. But this stuff here goes down a bit deeper, right, down to two meters or so. And that's not so, I mean, two meters is quite a bit for earthworks. So I'm wondering if that might actually be some sort of uh, river valley or something from a previ previous glaciation. So yeah. this, this low that you pointed out, this, it's north. You remember the, the sort of the, the river valley you had going on? Oh, yeah, I think it comes through here. Yeah, yeah. there's a low that comes through. So here. maybe this was a previous version of that valley or something like that. That's true. The one, the one cross cutting relationship I have is this little pathway. If you look at it here, it goes down to about a meter. Yeah. So. Oh, I would suspect that would have been on the surface or cut just shallowly below it. Yeah. Um, when you, when you take like consideration of how high it was here, maybe it was somewhat buried. Yeah. Um, it's hard to say. Um, I, I can't imagine it was totally flat, you know, as a, mm -hmm. as a natural feature, right? That's I mean, flat things only exist once humans kind of sit on them for a long time. So probably flattened as part of like an agricultural program. But I don't know. Yeah, that's right. I don't know how much material we brought in there. Yeah. So, um, like you, you should be doing any pre processing on this thing, like GPR, GPR, like uh, before we interview something like this. So, like any kind of, uh, like, this I see later, you use, usually go do a lot of pre processing. Right, right, that filter the traces. Yeah. So, yes, I think I, I skipped over very quick. But uh, I did all my processing in Seismic Unix for this, after I dumped information from the unit. Um, it's uh, and compared to seismic data, it's a, it's a lot less arduous to process because it's just common offsets, right? So you don't have to bin and make gathers. And, um, and you, you don't want to over process GPR data because a lot of the things we're looking for are like noise, so like diffraction scattering from, from small things. So it's, you don't want to filter that out. So, like, I, I it kept it pretty basic. So, I mean, one thing that's different is that these, these machines have kind of like that drift inside of them, it's called wow. And so basically you subtract the wow out, just lowering the trace so that's, you know, it hovers around zero, right? Um, try to remove some of the effects of the surface. Just then I just balance the traces so that, you know, if you had one trace that had a huge amplitude, it doesn't wash everything else out. Um, the one more advanced thing I did was an FK filter. And it's because you get a very strong air wave in GPR. So in seismic, you know, you get your air wave, but it comes later than the wave that hits that receiver because they are slower than the ground. But in GPR, uh, the air wave hits it first because it travels faster in air than the ground. So uh, you, often in GPR, you get this great big wave at the top, and it's a great big linear thing. Uh, but it's really easy to move with FK. You just take out a slope of zero, essentially. You just reject all that, and everything else below it becomes apparent. And then uh, then for like the amplitude, it's uh, the, the same thing we do in seismic where we do the we wrap the traces to get energy attribute or like 
over transforming that is wrapped in fat and interpolate so we get those, those pictures that I was showing. Yeah. I, I can see that there's a band pass between the lambda and lambda. Yes. So in that frequency, also there are different types of noise. You can get FM radio frequencies. Oh, that's the point. Yeah, because FM it goes to like, like 100. And then there's like, a, I had to look at this once for this too. There's a, uh, some kind of emergency services thing at 500 megahertz, I think. I noticed throughout the day that the, the signal quality would change. I don't, I don't know if I could show it. Maybe it would be in this. It kind of comes in all at once. I might have cleaned it out in this, but these two grids here are side by side. And I noticed when I did the second one, it was a different time of day. And there was a lot more like random noise in, it in the late time. And I think that was probably for like the videos coming in. But, um, but uh, the filter I had seemed to clean it up more or less. Okay. okay. Does anyone online have any questions? Come on. I'm all questioning out. <laughs> I have one that has nothing to do with the science itself. But how did you get involved with doing this? this um, well, I've been involved actually for a long time. It's, um, uh, was probably my first geophysical experience. I took this on about 10 years ago as an undergrad because my friend, who was an archaeologist, took this project on and needed help setting up the field stuff. So I helped clear the area for the first GPR survey, although I didn't run that survey, but I was there for it. Um, when, when, um, and I should also mention I'm a member of the Sioux Valley itself, so I, this is my way of contributing back. But yeah, so I've been helping for, for a while. When, when um, there was the, the Kamloops uh, discoveries early in 2020, I think it was, there was all of a sudden a huge impetus to continue work. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was contacted to help, help them again with some renewed surveys, and, um, new technologies, and, and new areas. And, uh, so this is sort of my volunteers in, in a way. Okay, well, maybe that's a good spot to finish. So thanks, Chris. Thank you.